Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Solving Advent of Code in Rust and trying to learn to Rust in between. Um, I'm Eugene, and we have Roberto and Luciano around somewhere. Hello. Yeah, hello. <laughs> now, thanks, everybody, for joining and following along. If you never did Advent of Code, uh, this is a challenge that's published every year in December. Uh, the idea is that it leads, you get one challenge every day leading up to Christmas, basically. You can find all the challenges on adventofcode.com, and maybe we can get a banner for that. Um, I'm going to assume we got one because I can't actually yep. use the screen. <laughs> uh, we're publishing all of our code on GitHub, and we should get a banner for that as well. And we have a YouTube channel where you can see all of the recordings of previous streams. Also, if you're seeing this on YouTube, we stream every Monday at 6 p.m. Irish time. Uh, you can find the link for the YouTube channel in the description of the Twitch channel, and you can find the link to the Twitch channel in the description of the YouTube channel. <laughs> there you go. We couldn't, we couldn't make it any easier. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty simple. They're interlinked, as people would say. So today, we're going to take a look at exercise 16 for last year. It's very complicated so i think i'm going to start by going through the readme and try to kind of explain what the goal is and then we'll have uh, roberto going through the python version and luciano going through the rust version uh can you share my screen please i think i can i don't know why that link is not going away but i guess we'll figure it out <laughs> fair enough thank you it's going to stay there forever now it's Probably. our life <laughs> We have to live with it. It's all links, guys. That's what the internet is about. Anyway, uh, right. So this particular exercise is called Packet Decoder. They have complicated things by calling it Buoyancy Interchange Transmission System, or BITS in short. It is actually an exercise that has to do with BITS. The idea is that we get a long hexadecimal string. We have to convert it to binary and then read bits of data from that binary to try to decode the message. Can you zoom one point or two? I can indeed. Fine. Uh, the text is definitely going to help. It hasn't confused us at all, and it hasn't taken way too long to understand what this, <laughs> this Full disclaimer. is about. We have solved this one in Python and in Rust already, and we're going to go through the, our solutions, but it took me a list three hours i think just to wrap my head yeah. around the protocol to I me too. Know, Robert. Yes. yeah to me the same i wrote a gif decoder in micro python without any library it was easier and i also wrote <laughs> assembly function for micro python it was easier than doing this so this is going to be fun to try to do it and explain it in one hour so yeah. please yeah. give us all the more support you can give us and all the money that you want that we are not against that <laughs> If we only had a donation, but right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, they can put money in an envelope and send them uh, Dublin. Somebody will get it. <laughs> Two, Roberto, Dublin. Roberto, yeah. Dublin. I'm sure there's only one. <laughs> well, probably. Cool. So let's uh, get stuck into this because it's going to take a very long time. So, like I said, the idea is that we get a long hexadecimal string. I can actually show it to you if you're curious. If this bad boy right here and it just goes and goes and goes and goes on forever now they've encoded this as packets uh, of variable length obviously and the way it works is the first six numbers in the decimal in the big decimal string represent a version number and the packet type id so the first three represent the version number which is an actual number just represented as binary and the packet type id are the next three bits in binary, which represent the, uh, what they call it, the content type ID number, I think. Yeah, type ID four. Type ID four is the only type ID there is, and the only one that we actually care about. If the, so actually, maybe let's first go with what happens if type ID is four, and then we'll complicate things by going with uh, what happens if it's not. Mm -hmm. So if the type ID is four, this means that we need to read a number following this. The way to do that is we read four groups of four bits, and depending on what number they start with, in this case, the or five bits maybe we're supposed to read. Yeah, groups of five bits. So if it starts with a one, we know it's not the last group. The next four are part of our binary number. 
again, if it starts with a one, it's not the last group and the numbers are actually part of our binary number. If it starts with a zero, then this is the last group, which is the end of this particular packet. And we can completely assemble our binary number. We can parse it and we have an actual number. Now, when we get to one of these, to the end of one of these groups, we'll need to parse six things again, six bits again. The first three will represent another version number. The next three are going to represent, let's say they're not going to represent a four this time. So we can actually go through the, uh, through the solution, uh, sorry, through the ask in its entirety. So if the number isn't a four, we need to read the next bit. And if the next bit, uh, sorry, the next bit is going to be called length type ID if content type ID is not four. And if it's a zero, the next 15 bits represent the total length of the sub packets contained. If it's 11, if it's a one, then the next 11 bits represent the number of sub packets immediately contained by this package. So mm -hmm. what this means in plainer English, I suppose, is you read the six bit. If the last three of them are not a four, you read the next one. If it's a zero, you know how many other packets, sorry, the 15 following bits represent the length of bits that you have to read for the sub packets contained by this packet. So you can basically chunk the next, uh, you, sorry, you read the next 15, you get a number from that. And after it, you read that length of number and that will be the sub packets that you have. For those sub packets, you'll have to parse them similar to how, how mm -hmm. we did this. So we need to read this first six bits again, check the version number, check the type ID, blah, blah, blah. Um, so if I can summarize, we are basically, we have like a frame based protocol, yeah. but the frames are not equal size and not equal type. So we'll need to figure out what is the type, what is the size, and also we can have nested packets. Yeah. So we, we might have this thing where it says, well, by the way, this packet contains other packets. So go in like one yeah. level deeper and chunk this them out. This packet well. can contain three other packets and a packet of these three other packets can contain two other packets mm -hmm. and that type id that is four in part one can we just get a four or something else mm -hmm. in part two will become uh, more meaningful so the only one that can't contain other packets is the number four which is basically a literal value it's a number yep. all the others can contain other numbers or other packets which will inevitably contain other numbers Anyway, so I'm not sure if this made too much sense because I kind of went through it too quickly. So do feel free to ask questions in the chat if this didn't make too much sense. Maybe going through the solutions might help uh, or maybe not. Anyway, to sum it up, uh, so we have to do this recursive parsing of packets, which can be either numbers or recursively packets with other numbers inside them. And our ask for the first part is to add up all the version numbers in all the packets. And the puzzle answer was 938 for this particular one. Mm -hmm. So should I give it over to Roberto to go through the Python version, maybe? Is it worth summarizing, I guess, the difference between part one and two? I think it's better to address them separately because uh, I implemented okay. them in two different ways, similar ways, mm -hmm. but different ones. Uh, instead, in your case, I think you did one uh, one class yeah one to, parser and then the to catch them all. Yeah. yeah. Okay, instead but I think just them. just to summarize high level the differences in part one, you only need to parse enough information to basically know where every frame starts and ends and what's the version of every frame. And at the end, you need to give the sum of every single version number for every frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead, in part two, you really need to understand all the details because it kind of builds up a recursive uh, expression, mathematical expression, and then we'll need to build like an evil function that goes in and actually calculate the result of that expression and then the response. Well, the final output is the, the result of that evil. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Or do I remember wrong? Yeah. No, no, it's okay. correct. Complicated, but correct. So should I switch to Roberto? Yeah, let's go through part one. Then we can, if you want to show part one in Rust, or if you makes, if you think that makes sense for Rust to show the two parts together, we can uh, read part two, explain part two in Python, then jump in the Rust. Yeah, let's see want. how it goes. Let, let's try to figure it out. Okay, on spot. part one. We just want to sum up the version. Cool. <laughs> so, 
I created a class. I think it's the only exercise I created a class for this one in advent of code for this year, because it it was hard to reason on top of this. So I needed extra structure to help my reasoning. Um, mm. When I wrote the class, in the end, we are taking uh, the number that is the long, long, long number. Mm. Thank you, Python. We can have an integer out of this number without uh, big integers or any other import of any other class. This is going to be fun to compare to the crap I did in Rust. <laughs> I just parse it as a 16, um, a base 16 number. I create my class giving that number as an input and I parse it. Result, 938. What uh, is this class doing? This class is taking uh, something in input. I tried at the beginning of keeping in the class the number as a number. The problem is that you have to take 3 bit, then 1 bit, then 4 bit, then 5 bit, then 11 bit, then 15 bits. And uh, working with masks, moving the masks, shifting the number, and everything else was a mess. So in the end, uh, uh, if you pass me a string of 0 and 1, I memorize the string. Otherwise, I convert the number in a string of 0 and 1, and I save it in my buffer string that is a local variable to the class. Mm -hmm. It's a public variable. I don't I care like about the variables called BS. Yeah, BS is the buffer <laughs> string, the big mm -hmm. string, call it or, like you want. Or bool string. Bool uh, string, exactly. <laughs> uh, what, here, just, a star, just something to notice. If the number start with, uh, like it is, I think, uh, here it starts with an eight. An eight is one zero zero zero. So this is not happening. The string would have started with one zero zero zero. But if this was a four, the four the first four bits are zero one zero zero. If I was not doing this streaming in this line, I would have forgot about the first bit, and all my string was shifted by one bit, and nothing was working because obviously here mm. even one bit makes a lot of difference. So here I'm rounding the length of my number to four bit. I'm going through the number and the usual division to see modulo one to see if it is uh, um, zero or one, putting that on the left and not on the right because I start uh, with the most significant bit on the left and not on the right. And I have my string. Then we go to parse. Ret is the counter of the version. So in Ret, <laughs> I keep the final sum of all the versions together. So while I have a string to go through, I take three bit. This is my version. I sum that to my retard value. Cool. Mm -hmm. I take the type that are the next three bit. If type is four, this of is a little. Of course, I suppose that take is your own utility that also take is my own utility. That into a number, right? Into an the integer. Take n chart right. from the string. It converts this bias to number to a number. It shift the buffer string getting rid of the number that I read so they are pushed out I could have done with an index and a position this was making stuff more complicated no uh, go away mm -hmm. I read the bit I don't need them anymore go away mm -hmm. and I return the number so you're so basically I, consuming the, the string yeah I'm consuming the string and getting rid of it I could have keep, kept the string and uh, I could have gone on with a pointer. It was too much moving parts when I wrote this. Mm -hmm. Come on, it was Christmas. I was eating every day and I was very <laughs> <laughs> bloated sometimes. If it is a literal, what I do, I start, uh, why I have a J1 here that I don't use J. Okay, this is a variable that is left over from somewhere. <laughs> I have an accumulator to start to read the number. While through, I take five bit, only the f I, I shift the accumulator by four bit. Only the lowest significative bit uh, for bit of these uh, five bit are used to create the accumulator. I use them. I use the fifth bit only to check if I have to go on or to break. Mm -hmm. If I have to break, I break. And in my ac uh, accumulator, I have my uh, my literal that I don't care about because in this part one, I don't care about. Mm -hmm. it. I yeah, this know. part one, you only need the version which you already yeah, have, uh, and then you need to understand when the packet finish and the next packet yeah. begins. I wanted to say, sorry, just to highlight again that this is that first bit of parsing that they told us about, the line saying if t equal equal 4. This is yeah. basically 
the second header for each package and this one's telling us it's a literal it's the type yeah. id this the... is the version id v and mm -hmm. the type id t obviously because why using letters <laughs> keep it short um yeah. as if it is not type 4 i have to read one bit i take only one bit if the bit is zero i have to take 15 bits that will be l that they will be the uh number of bit ahead of me and i'm taking uh, this uh, number of bit take row is doing what take does is only that is not converting to an integer but mm. is giving you the string because so it's just point stripping I... data right without yeah i'm taking the n bit from the string getting rid of them and passing them back mm -hmm. without converting them to a number because it's useless because the, the why converting back to a number to then reconvert the number to a binary a, a string of one and zero let's keep also because Instead, in this part of the exercise we don't really need to worry about what's the actual content of the packet right no we need to sub go to the sub packet and get the version of the sub packet but we have the sub packet oh right instead right. if uh, this uh, i is a z is a one we have to read 11 bit cool those 11 bit are a number that I'm not using mm -hmm. because basically what I have to go on with is everything else is left in the buffer because or I have an amount of bit or I go on with everything that is left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I create a sub packet going, going in recursion with classes. So here I'm in a class, I create another instance of the same class with what is left to work with. Mm -hmm. And I sum to my return value the sub packet parse. So I'm parsing what mm. is left in the sub message. I sum to ret. In the end, I return ret. Yeah, this I is have, an interesting uh, way to do recursion in a class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep instantiating the same class internally and call yeah, the same method. I okay. I like it. Yeah, I could have done this probably with a function and not with a class. Like I say, the class was. Uh, to have a utility method to take numbers out, a number of bits. It was to, yeah, to keep have less move. Yeah, it was to be able to reason on less stuff at the same time because this was already complicated. After all of this, I have a number. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, I don't remember if this is already Luciano input or my input, but in the end, I think the output is the same number. So 938, we had in yeah. the readme. <clears throat> yes, so it's, it's probably already updated with channel stuff. So this is solving part one. Do we want to read part two? Because part two is uh, more funny. <laughs> or do we want to show Rust now? We can try to show Rust, okay. but I think I have done part one and part two in the parsing. So you'll need to guide me a little bit on what we can skip for now. And we'll yeah, visit cool. later. So let me switch the screen. That perfect. So you should see now my VS code, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So part one, I'm just going to start from the higher level and then we'll kind of zoom in. The way I modeled it is that I basically have a, a struct called packet parser, which can just read the X string. And then you basically have an object and that object represents uh, a collection basically of all the packets. So basically on the collection of packets in for what concerns part one, we are just going to map and then it's every packet from every packet. We get the version and then we just call sum. Now this is version sum and this is, we'll see what that means in a second, mm -hmm. but the high level, this is the structure. So we have a packet parser, which will give us some collection of packets, the collection of packets as a method called version sum. And then finally, we do a sum. Now, the reason why there is like a two level sum is because this one will go deeper on the other levels. And so basically we, we sum everything at the top level and then all the results at the top level, we sum them together. Mm -hmm. okay. Now let's start to look at this first function from X. So what we do, we pass the entire input, which is our X string. And we have this uh, binary string helper. Let me remember how I did this one. Binary string. Binary string basically is an helper structure which has all the bits mm -hmm. represented as a vec dq of u8. And then there is another uh, value called consume bits, which is just a pointer to basically the place where we have read so far. 
Now okay. this binary string, we initialize it with this from X and this is something super ugly. So please, if you have any better idea, let me know. But I thought this was the easiest way to, to get it done quickly. Basically what I do, I iterate over every single character and then for every single character, which is gonna be a value in the X alphabet. So from zero to F, what I'm gonna do is literally say every single case listed one by one, if it's zero, that is equivalent to these four bits and so on and so forth. So basically at the end of the day, I'm gonna build a list of bits mm -hmm. where every bit is literally just a zero or a one. So uh, represented as a U8 basically. Could have done this differently? I don't know, probably yes. But this was just easy for the same reason that Roberto explained that if you had like a big sequence of bytes, basically row bytes, then because we are reasoning in bits and the bits are not aligned in any way, kind of keeping the offsets and keeping the masks and doing all that operation would have been a little bit messy. I actually tried and I gave up at some point. So this approach led me to a much simpler implementation. Yes, also because at one point you have to pass uh, to some other function the same input starting in a random place of the is mm -hmm. a mess in bits and not in bytes <laughs> that is, yeah I, I think if we if you build like maybe a library that allows you to generalize all the stuff and the library internal is dealing with all the complexity of keeping the masks and the offsets at that point maybe you can get a more efficient implementation but again yeah. i didn't feel like it was worth going down that path Okay, so then what else do we have? You are giving back uh, the, this uh, list, uh, vector. What is it, a vector? Mm -hmm. I'm giving back from a this uh, a self. So this is kind of a constructor. So yeah, speak. it's a vector and a position. And it gives you back this vector queue of U8, where I think every value is just a one or a zero. And yeah. then you have consumed bits, which is literally counting how many have been consumed so far. Okay. Then let's see, what do I do if we go back to... Uh... And this so, was the parse of your... So uh, this will X be the parser. Then you we... Add... From X. From X, yeah. This is what we did. Mm -hmm. So if we check, for instance, map, what does it do? Oh, sorry. This is the actual map. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention an interesting detail that could be useful to mention. Let me see. But from X is only doing that conversion. From yeah. X is only doing, let's see. It seems yeah, to call select and, then, and then returns this binary string. Ah, okay. Okay. So map is going to actually find your packets then, I'm assuming. Map, the reason why map works is because I think I expose this uh, list of bits. I think I have implemented the ref. Let me see if I can find it. And we can explain also how that works. But I might remember wrong. Did I implement the ref? Maybe not. So how does this parser work? So this is a packet parser. Let's see. Don't delete oh, it. No. Implements an iterator. So that's why we have, um, we can do dot mm -hmm. map. Okay. Because it implements an iterator and the iterator will give us uh, packets one by one. So okay. there is a little bit of abstraction there that is kind of a streaming parser in a way, if you want. So as you keep iterating, we'll give you uh, packets as they are completed. Yeah, I can see the whole next packet thing, mm -hmm. which is assuming, I'm assuming so is what... this is the next thing we'll need to check, basically. Uh-huh, cool. So, okay, so this packet parser basically contains a binary string internally. Mm -hmm. So it manages it for us. So it's not too different from what, from what Roberto did with a class. Now, next packet should be, I guess, pretty much a similar implementation that we discussed with Roberto with the difference that here I have a generic version that parses everything. So we'll try to ignore things that are relevant for part two, part not two. for part one. Yeah. So the first thing yeah. that we do, I also add a bunch of helper methods, for instance, get int and the number of bits. So mm -hmm. this is equivalent to what Roberto did. Yeah. What did you call it? Take. 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 So this is basically saying, take the next n bits, in this case, three, and convert them to an int. By default, it's going to be an i64, and this is the version. Then every time you call uh, get int, I think it consumes as well. Let's see how it's implemented. Uh, to do, yeah, it, it increases the number of consumed bits. So do we use this one? Does it dequeue? 
Let's see. Yeah, it does a pop front. So basically, this is how we are consuming from that back DQ. Okay. So it's very similar to what Robert is doing, but rather than just slicing it, I'm basically popping one by one in a loop. So maybe uh, not you the are most using efficient. A, too elevated to the power of I to set the position of the bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of uh, popping one by one and increasing the, the counter yeah. of the integer. I Instead, I'm shifting uh, that is more or less the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it might be faster though, right? Just... I don't have to do two to the power of uh, something mm -hmm. every time because I'm just shifting bits. We could, this is, could be an idea for refactoring. Actually, let's let's note it down to do use by uh, bit shift. shift. Bit shifting. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically what get int is doing. So if we go back mm -hmm. where we were, I lost it. Next packet. Basically, uh, every time we do get int, we are consuming a number of bytes, getting back an integer. So we get the version and the type ID this way. And then I have this uh, match based on the type ID that eventually is going to get back packet data. So if it's four, which I think is our uh, literal case, right? Yeah, is the literal. What it's doing is it creates groups. Hmm. As you have to read the multiple uh, four bits every time. So you are, you are creating the queue to put the four bits in there every time. Quick. Oh, Nicola, thank you for, for the follow. I was going to say thank you very much for following. By and the way, let, let us know in the chat how did you find us. And if you're interested in Rust, what's your experience? And if you have any question, feel free to ask. Yeah. Okay, and we so... don't uh, give refunds. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. everything is for free right now. But if you pay anything, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so groups. I don't remember what groups was for, but I think we'll need to read. Uh, groups, you are putting your, is my accumulator, what I was calling mm -hmm. accumulator, is your groups. You are taking oh, the yeah. four bits all together, then you are squashing them together at one point for sure. Exactly, and I need to figure out when is the last one. And the last one is basically when you get the first bit and that bit is zero, right? Yeah, when that bit is uh, one or zero, not zero, yeah. Zero. Yeah, so basically for every group we read the first bit, and if that bit is zero, that means this is the last group. Not for every group, for the, in for the input string, you read a bit, if the bit is zero, you still have to read the next four bit, but this will mm -hmm. be the last one. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So what I do, I read the next four bits, and I push them in the group, and then if it's the last one, we break. So eventually okay. here we will have either four bits or a number of bits that is a multiplier of four. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. Then at this point, we can calculate the value of n using the four bits in groups. And here, I think, again, we can use shift. Yeah, we can buy shift again, yeah. Also, you are, do, you are uh, looping reversely because uh, in this exercise, there is a lot of... Uh, left uh, big endian little endian problem so some mm -hmm. bits are more significative from the left and some are from the right yeah so basically here what i'm doing i'm taking all the bits and trying to build an integer out of it and yeah this is not the most optimized way to do that but it's the way my brain thinks about it so kind of a literal conversion to my thought into rust code as we keep saying on this channel waiting is better than perfect so Exactly. So packet data, it's actually interesting. And I didn't explain that because it's an enum that tries to represent, represent all the different types of packets. So in this case, it's a literal value. And the value is the one that we just converted from this group of bits. So I am literally initialize a packet data of variant literal with this value. If we want to see, we have two different types, literal with a value and expression which is just going to be a vector of packet. Mm -hmm. So we can initialize a packet data in either one or the other form. Okay, then back to, where were we? Too much? You have to start yeah. to remember the, uh, name, the line yeah. numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the other case is when is not four, should we read it? I think we still need to read it, yeah. right? We do, just... yeah. yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Go, Roberto. Just... No, I will say without explaining what we do with the other type of sub packets, but we have to explain that when we read 15 and when we read 11. Exactly. So when we read 15, it's based on the length type. Length type is we need to read the first bit. If it's zero, 
is 15. If it's anything else, it's 11. Mm -hmm. Now, here I could have done one, but the reason why I'm doing underscore is because I saved this as a U8. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if I did yeah. one year, then Rust is like, oh, this match is not comprehensive. Yeah, fair enough. Another thing I was thinking at some point is to do an enum for one and zero and just do Oh, my a... God. But then I kind of <laughs> gave up on that. <laughs> Maybe that could have been a little bit more efficient on this kind of match statements. And also, I think Rust will do some smart bit packing if you do something like that. But yeah, something else we could do. I think we tried something like that in the past and was not worth it. was not fast. Yeah. And also, a lot more verbose to write all the yeah, for sure. variants. Anyway, uh, what do we do with sub packet length num bits? So we have to do, uh, we have to read all of that. And that is going to be the length of the sub packets. Then we have this uh, vector of packets that initially is empty. And then if length type is zero, that is the number of bits of all the sub packets. So we can just parse uh, all these bits. And otherwise, uh, number otherwise of sub it packets. is the number okay. of the sub packets. Yeah. So basically, if length type is zero, it's like a constant. We know exactly how many bits do we need to read. Otherwise, we just know the number of packets, so we just need to read a certain number of packets. Then, should I continue here? Is this? Then you return after this. You return something, but at I the return moment an we don't care. Yeah. yeah, we don't care what we return. Now exactly. there was the function some version, right? There was a function here in version part sum, one. So. Version sum. Yeah. yeah, we definitely need to look at. So version sum, what it does is is going to initialize version sum starting from self version. So a packet can contain multiple sub packets. Either it's like a standalone packet or as sub packets. So version sum is kind of a, an agnostic way to say, just give me the sum of all the packets in this packet. If it's Including alone, it's going to be its own and that's it. But if it contains sub packets, it's going to be its own plus the value of all the sub packets. So what we do is basically a recursive function and it starts from itself and then it says, if it's an expression, so this is kind of a, a if let, so if it's of type expression, the data, then it means that there are sub packets. So for every sub packet, keep calling version sum. So this is where the recursive call happens mm -hmm. and keep summing to this value, which is the one que that gets returned at the end. Question here. If you return a packet data that is a literal, does the literal type still has uh, um, the sub packet in it or the not? literal type? Uh, where did I write it? There. It just has an I64. Ah, it just has an I64. It okay, so it doesn't have, uh, so it's not possible to iterate on top of something that you don't mm. have. Cool. Keep in mind and that this is my packet structure. So packet data is just one field of the actual packet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that dot data is that one that comes from the vector. Okay, cool. Understood. Okay. Anything else? I think that covers everything, right? And then there is the last sum outside of the map. Mm -hmm. Just to cover the Which, case that the... Uh, sorry. No, Here. No. There. So this, this will do like a map. Let's say that there are uh, three packets. Uh, one standalone packet, then another packet which contains a sub packet. So basically... The first time we do this, it's just going to give me the value of the first flat packet. Then for the next packet, it's going to go recursively and take its own value and the value of the sub packet. So at the end, we have two numbers. So this dot sum, sum them together. So to explain it another way, what I'm doing, I'm kind of moving everything to the top level. So every node only knows how to sum all its children. And then the last level, which is going to be the, like the top level of the this tree expression, I sum all the values with this dot sum. We have a question from Tommaso. We're saying if the vector saved us from having a recursive struct. Um, Let me it up. Oh, you were doing it as well. Go, go click. <laughs> what right. does he mean by recursive struct? I think similar to what you did in Python, mm -hmm. where you have the class that keeps recursively creating a new class ah, on what's okay. left. Whereas here we're using the vector queue uh, to store and consume the bits. Let me make sure... Everything that you write recu with recursion, you can write it without recursion. 
uh, only that uh, using recursion is uh, simpler to reason on. I mean, like we say, mm -hmm. we were already thinking about a lot of moving parts uh, and having recursion was oh. helping us to get better. Tomas has actually answered what I was going to ask earlier. <laughs> Uh, he's saying that in Rust, you're not allowed to have recursive struct because at compile time, the compiler doesn't know how much memory should be allocated. Which yeah, I think that's time. a good comment. I think the trick here is because I'm using a vector, I am already putting stuff in the heap. So this is how I'm kind of circumventing this limitation because this is just going to be a pointer to data in the heap, if that makes sense. Yeah, but with vector is no problem in this case exactly so that that's a very good point like generally it's much more complicated to to do this kind of recursive structures but because we're using vec vec makes our life easier because it's kind of a smart pointer on its own basically mm -hmm. typically when you do bit packing you tend to be cpu friendly i don't think this bit packing is very cpu friendly uh, i mean it's not aligned not. Uh, it has a lot of uh... I am it's very crazy. ashamed of this implementation, but I went more for, uh, let's keep it as simple as readable as I can from my no own mental model, rather than trying to make it very efficient. But I think there is really a lot of opportunities to make this. And also for easier. your mental health. Yeah, and mental health, yes. Because <laughs> I, it was also Christmas for me and I was also eating a lot and I was already <laughs> sleepy enough. <laughs> okay, should we switch back to Python part two? Or read me part two. Or oh, read me read part, two. part yes. two. So let me do that. Read me part two. So I'm going to switch me. to Eugen. Please let me know if it's readable or if I should zoom in. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. Switch to Robertus. <laughs> sorry, I still need to get used to this. Uh, Video Ninja is what we are using to control our stream. And it's super powerful, but also you need to get used to it. Sponsored by Video Ninja. <laughs> it's a free service. It's free yeah. Sponsored <laughs> by a free service. Ooh. And by sponsored by Roberto means they let us use it for free, same as everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> so part two, assuming it's uh, readable on everybody's screen. So now that we have the structure of the transmission decoded, we can calculate the value of the expression. Oh, by the way, disclaimer for everyone: I've not actually done this exercise, and I've not actually read part two before. So. <laughs> You are going to go through confusion together with me, unless uh, Luciana or Roberto decide to help out. We'll Eugen see. is using confusion. Is a super effective. <laughs> so they're telling us again that type ID four represents a single number as described before. So the ones we just parsed in uh, Roberto and Luciano's code. The remaining IDs are more interesting. They say so. Packets with a zero are some packets. Packets with ID one are product minimum, maximum, greater than, less than, and equal to packets. Okay, so I'm assuming we're going to do some simple math and conditionals mm -hmm. within this thing. And let's see if they only have a single sub packet. Okay, for some, I presume you sum all the sub packets that they have and whatever operations they might contain. Packets with type ID one will multiply the values of their sub packets. If they only have one, the value is the value of the single. Okay. Minimum, which is basically the dot min function in Python and probably 50,000 other programming languages. <laughs> Max will do the same. Greater than, these are the ones I'm not understanding. So their value is one if the value of the first sub packet is greater than the value of the second sub packet. Otherwise, their value is zero. So mm -hmm. there is an assumption here that there's always exactly two. Okay. Packets with type ID six less than, I'm presuming they operate the same, they do. So they return one if the first is lower than the second, and there's always two. And equality works the exact same way. It's a one yeah. if they're actually equal, it's a zero if the two packets are not. Cool. It's kind one of a way. mini language that we have in our packets to build like an expression, right? Yeah. A mathematical expression. Makes sense. Well, it's not just mathematical expression, it's conditionals as well. We have Yeah, but eventually they, they, the conditions evaluate to a number that is either zero or one. That's and true. then you might have that as part yeah. of another higher level expression, which can be, I don't know, a max, a mean, a sum, or a difference, or something like that. Yeah, that's fair enough. Okay, we can work out the value for the outermost packet in our transmission. Okay, so what do you get if you evaluate the expression represented by the hexadecimal big as string? 
uh, or, or bit string. B A S. Yeah, <laughs> big ass string. Sorry. Okay, so our puzzle answer was ginormous number. Cool. Uh, I'm hoping this made sense. This actually made sense to me, surprisingly. We spent a lot more time trying to understand the first part than this part. Mm -hmm. So should we go over the Python solution? Yeah. Which is probably going to be the more readable one and is going to kind of clarify the packet IDs better than I did. Yeah, I think, again, it's worth thinking about this problem as a tree or a forest of trees, basically. <laughs> where every node can either be a literal, so just one specific number, or it can be another expression. When it's another expression, it needs to have a type, type ID that says, what kind of expression this is? Is it like a sum? Is it a difference? Is it a minimum, a maximum, or so on? And then that expression will have sub-packets, which again, can be either other expression or can be literals. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine that as a tree where you have either numbers or symbols that indicate operations, and then you have to resolve it that way. Quick question before we actually dive in. This is assuming we're still keeping the rules from before uh, alive. So this, yeah, yeah. you still read packets in the same way, only now yeah. we're actually making sense, making use of the type ID. Yes. Okay. Version, uh, types. Uh, here we don't use the version. We just have the version that is a number that we don't use anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we focus on the type and the, and, and the literals that we were extracting before, because before we were extracting the literals. We were doing nothing with them, mm -hmm. but we were extracting. Fair enough. Okay. So let's switch over to Roberto's screen, unless we've already done that. And let's see Python. I haven't done that, so bear with me for a second. There we go. Cool. So part two, again, here I don't reuse the code. I copy and paste, because true heroes copy and paste. Um, <laughs> Take row, take, and the init is the same as part one. We still go with the string of one and zeros. We still take bit as a number, or we take bit as a string to be able to do. Now, the parse is a little bit uh, different. Um, let's uh, not take limited account for now. I will explain this uh, later. <laughs> Again, okay. we take. We take a version, we take a type. If the type is a literal, we parse the literal. Again, I have j equal one. I don't use j. I don't know why I declared it. This is a leftover from some tests, probably. Maybe. If I find a literal, I, I yield the literal. So this is a generator. Why this is a generator? Uh, because if we go into a multiple a packet with multiple numbers, then I can yield the single multiple numbers in the other type, taking them and uh, having a list out of them, and then I can take all the numbers that I want. It will be more clear later. Here, if it's a one or 15 bits, I take the 15 bits, I create a substructure with myself, with just this number that is a 15 bit number, bits, and I go through my uh, recursion. Here I have list. So due to the fact that parse is a generator, mm -hmm. I'm making a list out of this uh, generator because numbers oh. is uh, the variable that keep the numbers that I have to use uh, with the specific type ID, the uh, type of operation that I have. It's not the type ID, it's the operation ID. I don't remember how it's. No, it's the type ID. Type ID. Type ID. Content yeah. ID even. Yeah, yeah. Type ID. Sorry. sorry. If it's 11 bit, again go through this i parse again my um, my structure i take uh, what's left and i put it back in the box if it's zero is a sum so i held a sum of all my numbers if, remember numbers is a list and so i can do sum on it i held mm -hmm. it because i could have been in some level of nested recursion so somebody above me is collecting all of my yield in a list mm -hmm. it is like a problem if it is yeah. a product, I yield the product, I yield the minimum, I yield the maximum. If it's greater, I yield one. If the num first number is greater than the second one, and here there is the assumption that I only have two of them, and I always have two of them. If it is a six, I do less than. If it is seven, I do equal, and I have my set. That uh, limit, probably I'm not using it. <laughs> Let me check what I did. <laughs> we'll add to the secrets at the end. Limit is known. I never use it. 
could be yeah, something else you did for testing maybe you just yeah to test a certain number of bits uh, for testing yeah. to limit the recursion le uh, level to limit how much it was going in recursion now we are basically i'm just uh, going through until there is something in the buffers until in my string there is something to parse i go on and i parse mm -hmm. when i'm done with all of this again i have the body of my part two that is taking the big number converting to an integer packing here when i call parse parse is a generator i have to get as a list all the element yielded the first level will just yield one element because the first uh, uh, packet will contain sub packets that we contain some packet that will contain some mm. packet. yeah so that so, basically starts the recursion Right. Yeah, and my result, as you see, is a list with only one number in it. That is our solution. Mm. So, for my you could have used like next, right? Would yeah, I could have used same? next, but in the end, you have to copy and paste this in their website, so they don't complain. Yeah, here I could. No, have I mean, done, if uh... you wanted to have uh, uh, just a number without the array, would that be the same? Oh no, no, mm. next as a function. I mean, isn't there in mm. Python a function called next that just give you the next item from a generator or not? I don't remember if it is on the generator. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I wrote a lot of SQL recently. <laughs> I don't remember if it is on the generator. I think there is just, if you just call replace list with next. Yeah, yeah, I let me try this before, then we try what you were saying. I think this okay. is Rust, not parsed. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not exactly. Yes. Sorry, I'm mixing uh, Rust with Python with <laughs> SQL. I'm doing a mess. Now let's so, yes. do this in SQL. This is this is take cool. This is my god, let's not think about it. this. Is taking uh, uh, the first element of this generator that is the only event. Uh, I mm -hmm. was doing a list also to check if I was right because if you have two elements in that list, oh, it right. means that something went wrong because you forgot to do something that's like fair. a sum a or a mean. Instead of doing a next, you don't see if you forgot to do something, mm -hmm. but in any case. The result is the same, nobody cares. So, That's yes, point. the biggest we were already parsing the sub packets. Uh, the biggest stuff that I did here was just using yield and using a generator to keep stuff simpler. Yeah. I mean, I could have just gone with uh, a return list here, appending to the return list uh, and return a list in the end. Then, the, so the level above me was not going to need to create a list but then when you start to pass list around in python you're passing references uh, i prefer the two yield mm -hmm. it was also simpler when i was writing it to think on top of it okay my job here is done why because i yielded so hmm. i have nothing else to do here this is my literal somebody above me will take care of this number Makes sense. sounds very good i like uh, the the yield approach now i don't know if if it's kind of one of those things that is going to destroy performance uh, from, no, from a but... logic perspective, it's very easy to to follow. At least to... probably, it probably is not as performant as uh, okay because in the end I'm allocating a list. Probably is not that performant, but uh, I mean it's easier to reason on top of it, and it, it can uh, remove uh, bugs, uh, and uh, bugs are expensive uh, time wise in other ways. If you really want to have performances, you have to go to compiled languages, not stuff in Python for sure, mm -hmm. and uh, to other approaches and changing this binary protocol if you want to be efficient yeah and to be honest this was one of those kind of exercises in advent of code where they are not looking for the performance solution but it's more can you wrap your head around all this like binary stuff and recursion stuff i don't think i mean it's definitely solvable even with a non-optimized solution yeah also because the number is long but it's not that long mm -hmm. Yeah, there is not going to yeah. be a lot of nesting, basically. Exactly. Huh. Okay. So, Rust, what have you Should done in Rust? we switch to Rust? Let me try to do the switch. Not necessarily obvious. Okay. By the way, okay. if you want to try this in SQL, please go on and send us the query. <laughs> yeah, and, and remove any friendship that we might have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, by the way... Twitch is telling me that he wants to do an advertisement. So I'm just going to snooze it for the next five minutes. Hopefully <laughs> yeah. we'll finish before then. But let me know in the chat if suddenly you see some advertisements or we stop explaining. Okay, so part two, let's see how it looks like from just the main. 
we again parse everything using our packet parser. Then th what we do is either we just extrapolate the first packet. So we assume it's a tree which has only one packet at the root and then everything is like coming up from that packet. So it's probably going to be an expression and then all the other nodes are there. I don't know if this was a safe assumption, but I think it seems to work with my example, with my input. So let's say it's okay. But if you have an input where it's maybe multiple packets, independent expressions, we can probably revisit this solution. Okay, so when we get that, the other thing we do is we just call eval and that's gonna be our result. So basically all my implementation is inside this eval function. And this is gonna be similar to what Roberto showed, a uh, recursive function. Hmm. Okay, so if we go here, I think this will look somewhat similar to what Roberto did. So we do a match over the data and data is a packet data. So we can have different types of packet data. Either we, is a lead. Go ahead. We have a question from Tomas. So Should if let we me put it on. Sorry. Ah, there we go. Sorry, I had to get my mouse off it. Uh, so in this case, a reference to a string is the input. So you aren't able to consume it. Are you using an index variable? Oh, yeah. I think we need to explain yeah. a little bit more. So we actually, we don't keep referencing the original source string, which is just a sequence of hexadecimal characters. We build a crappy, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. representation of that, which is literally a vec de queue of characters that are either zero or one. And then we consume that to create integers and expressions and other sub packets. So we don't manage the data in the most efficient way. We, I, mm. I, I think I tried and then I gave up very quickly because it was a bit of a mess. And mm. again, just in case you missed the beginning, the reason why is that it's a binary protocol, but it doesn't really think in bytes. It thinks more in bits. So doing all the masking and shifting and offsets was a mess. Maybe there are libraries that you can use to make your life simpler, but I just said, okay, I'm just going to keep it simple, allocate a sequence of zero and ones, and then use that sequence straight away. Even though, of course, from a memory perspective, I'm wasting so much memory that maybe I didn't need to waste. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it's not a mutable string. It's just a, a vec de queue, I think, underneath with all these one and zeros. I think Tomaso missed the, the very start where we spoke mm -hmm. about this, so that's probably it. It's yeah. good to do a refresher anyway for anyone who might have joined. Mm -hmm. No, keep asking questions if something is not clear to you. Okay, so what do we do here? So this eval needs to return an actual integer, which is going to be the, the final result of our calculation. And this is going to be a recursive function. And we always match for every packet, we match on the data of that packet. So if it's a literal, that means that this is the actual value. So it's like we found um, a leaf node in this tree. So we just need to bubble up that value. Then the other case, if this is an expression and this is much more complicated because we'll need to do another match, so like a nested match statement based on the type of that packet. So in the type, we have seen that there are different types. So there is zero, which is a sum. And basically what we do, we say, okay, iterate over, remember by the way, that when you get a sub packet, a sub packet contains a vector of packets. So it contains all the uh, children of that packet. So you can iterate over all of them and do something with them. So this is how we are doing recursion here. So here we are basically saying, okay, extrapolate this vector. And then based on the type of this packet, mm -hmm. map over all the children and do something with them. If the type is zero, you need to do a sum. If the type is one, you need to do a product. If the type is two, you need to do a min. And here I'm, I'm wrapping because when you use min, it's empty. It's just going to give you none. But then mm -hmm. we know that that's not going to be the case because inputs is generally uh, sufficiently healthy that we can take this kind of shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So min and max, we can simply unwrap. There is always going to be a min and a max because the collection has a list, I think, two items, probably one. But I mean, it's going to work anyway. And then number five is... Um, it's the greater than, I think. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, this is evaluating the two. So it's, it's getting children number zero and children number one and evaluating the major and just returning either one or zero. Uh, similarly, here is getting the two children, evaluating the minor expression and returning one or zero. And similarly, here 
left and right children and evaluating on equal and returning one or zero. Everything else should be unreachable because again, we know that the input is well formatted. But also we are reading only three bit, so we can't have other values. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, that, that's also true because there are eight uh, possible types. Yeah, plus the four that is the packet data that was a four. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible yeah. that you land here with a four there. Very good point. And that's basically it. Like there is nothing more to it. Cool. And advertisement starts in three minutes. So what do we want to do? Do we want to leave it at that for today and do the closing off? Do we have yeah. questions, comments? If there are no questions, uh, we could do some improvement to the bit shift, but it's not big improvement. I mean, we got a new uh, follower first off. Oh, thank you, from from one, I guess, for the follow. not going. Thank you. It's not going to improve a lot with bit shifting. Uh, then not the nether performance is uh, nether mm -hmm. readability. So uh, it's something that they would not do. Um, this was hard to rethink about oh. for me. At we least. have a question from Tomas. So he's asking how much will the code change if eval takes self and not reference to self? That's a good question. I'm not sure what would be the advantage of that. So do you mean taking ownership of or? Yeah, being... I don't think you'll be able then to call it recursively, right? If you do that, but no, you're calling it on top of the sub packet, not on itself. So in theory, you could, but it's more efficient to call with the reference or without memory wise or CPU wise. Mm. Mm. You could Line try to remove... avoid copy. There is also this one. I'm not sure. We we could try to to do that and see what's happening. Okay. We can avoid a copy. Oh yeah, because here we are referencing the reference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we do this, what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. It starts to complain a lot because yeah, you cannot move out. That that was my feeling. Yeah. Mm. Because at the end of the day, everything I think references that big vector queue of one and zeros. So mm. as soon as you call eval, you are basically ah. moving everything. This is my feeling, but yeah, my needs are a longer explanation. I think I understand. Mm, okay. Ah, yeah, because you're not copying, the ref. you're just referencing. He's saying remove the ref on line 98 as well. Come oh, on, let's try both, see what happens. If we try this, basically, right? Yeah. We can remove, remove this. Oh, not this one. X. Then try to remove also the yeah, reference. Again, point you, are, you are moving. At this point, you are moving. Try to remove the reference source on line 97. What's happening if you remove both of them? From the argument. No, not this, the reference. <laughs> yeah. No, that was complaining of the recursion. Yeah, okay. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Probably so... we can refactor it in some way to work without a reference, but I don't think we've got time to do that today. Yeah, exactly. So Mind of also... time. Advertisement in three seconds. Stay with us. We'll be back. Mm -hmm. uh... I know I did. I'm looking at Twitch, not the yet. Advertisement is starting, I mean, it means Fake that we have to do it. <laughs> Which means some people get an ad, but probably not everyone, I guess. Oh, no, I'm getting an ad now. So, hey, for those of you who aren't getting an ad, I'm getting an ad. Yeah, we'll stay here <laughs> quiet for 45 seconds. No, no. I say we this. talk crap. <laughs> oh, I'm getting the ad too now for 30 seconds. Yay. Mine is Uber Eats. What are you getting? Oh, McDonald's, McDonald's. McDonald's. Oh, yeah, it's McDonald's true Uber Eats. Or is it just McDonald's? Mc just Eat or Uber Eats. No, it's just McDonald's. Uh, oh, I'm getting, the, the... I'm getting the... <laughs> I'm getting the double ad. No, I just only got one. I got two of them. They're convinced I need way more burgers. So <laughs> we think that everybody's here. We should be back right now. I think so. Yeah, oh, this so. evening pizza. Good job, Tomas. I envy you. You got the better ad. <laughs> Are you doing the pizza or it's ordering pizza? Because doing pizza and is probably he's ordering better pizza than doing in, rust. Or in, if, he, if he's ordering pizza, in which country is, is he ordering pizza? <laughs> <laughs> it is a very important topic of discussion. Okay, should we wrap up for today or yeah, are there I further so. questions? If, if we're wrapping up, did we just make people watch an ad? <laughs> okay, Tommaso says in Italy, so yes, you can order pizza. You are you have my blessing. <laughs> yeah, Roberto <laughs> is the the international authority for, for 
<laughs> don't don't give him pizza and pineapple because you're gonna irritate the time. god of pizza and yeah, yeah you don't know what might happen he might uh, turn you into binary yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah rust and python had a different well i think it's more roberto and luciano who had a different approach to making this mm-hmm. i don't know if it's that much different to be honest what is the main difference you think, uh, Robert? Uh, well, uh, well, the main difference is uh, obviously in Rust you have to create a, more types to describe the data structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead, for me, it was just a string of one and zeros, and uh, I did and did all the distinction between uh, type, uh, literal type, expression. There was not a distinction. There was uh, a little bit more uh, il, if, else, if, else, if, else, if. Now, in the last version of Python, I think they added some match or some switch case statement. Uh, to be honest, I like Python not having it. And uh, if it, if this was production code, if the Python code I wrote was production code, I would never have used the if, else, if, else, if, else, if, if, but I would have gone with some kind of uh, dictionary representing lambdas that were then taken in account based on type, the usual approach to get rid of messages. And I think is way more readable that way than having a even match statements. Um, um, I wanted to add, we got a suggestion to use POM, which is a Rust parser. Uh, I just wanted to mention that for this series, we're generally trying to stick to the built-in stuff, like the core language features and so on, and stay away from libraries. Um, the libraries are great. And if this was production code, 100%, we'd do that. But the goal is for us to learn. So I suppose even building something that you could solve with the library can be useful to figure out how variable ownership works, how memory allocation works in Rust, all of this stuff. Sorry. Just... But to be honest, I would caveat that, that sometimes we took shortcuts, like in some exercises, we use either tools or other sure. small libraries. So and... It's not necessarily a hard rule. I'm actually curious to go and check the, no. the library and try to see if uh, if we can implement this in a much nicer okay. way. By the way, keep in mind that everything is open source. We have the repository on GitHub and we yeah. have accept, been accepting lots of PRs. By the way, thank you, Tommaso, for being the, yep. the, the, the best contributor out there <laughs> for this repository. So feel free, like if it's something that, I don't know, you want to show us, you have the time and the patience to do that, feel free yeah. to send a PR. I yep. will really appreciate that. That would be cool. No, I said we try. I know we haven't done it. And there also, there's all sorts of other stuff that we shouldn't be doing and we wouldn't in normal coding, like all the unwrapping. And, you know, there's differences between code you write for uh, advent of code and, you know. Oh, yeah. Look. Thomas is still waiting a beer we owe him. Yeah, it will happen. Hopefully, if I can make it to code motion this year, it will happen. Oh, you can take a flight to Dublin, no? Yeah. Well, yeah. if you take a flight to Dublin, you have at least one Guinness. Probably yeah, Guinness. Exactly. So. Well, three Guinness, Guinnesses, however you pluralize it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should totally come. Weather is great. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, not raining, but raining now. Yeah, and it's probably jacket weather. Anyway, yeah, it's great. Come to Dublin. Yeah, I mean, in Dublin, there is the Scrollinger rain. If you look at it, it rains. Otherwise, yeah, you don't <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> You right. never know, right? When you look at it, it's definitely raining. Otherwise, you never know. <coughs> it might be raining, it might not be raining. That's it. All right, guys. I think we're going to wrap it up now. Yeah. So you'll find the recording of this episode on YouTube together with the weird explanation and understanding what the heck this whole exercise is about. Uh, the link is in the Twitch about section to the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, we live stream every Monday at 6 p.m. Irish time, Dublin. Um, you'll find the link to the Twitch in the YouTube description. Uh, so make sure to check the Twitch channel. Like I said, we stream, so you can watch these things live, live and actually ask us questions and chime in and all that. Uh, feel free to leave us comments or open PRs like Luciano mentioned earlier. Uh, we should get a banner with a GitHub repo right now. Um, we should. Everything's That's very enough. well accepted. So yeah, like we said, we're trying to learn. Not all the solutions are idiomatic or clean or fast or perfect or anything like that. So any ideas that you have, definitely let us know. We can learn and we can showcase them on the channel later. So thanks everybody for the suggestions and collaborations, collaboration in the chat today. And uh, I think we're gonna raid someone, are we? We are. So you're gonna see some, I think, game making, game development, if you want to stay around on Twitch. So enjoy the show. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.